that. Um, so hi everyone, welcome to ArtsFest Online and to this afternoon's intellectual property workshop on the music industry with Dr. Mekka Patoshnik and Elizabeth Iwurie. Uh, please do switch on your cameras if you're able to. We would like this to be uh, as interactive as possible. And of course, you can also use the chat function as we go along. Um, just a reminder though, that this event is being recorded and it is a public platform, so don't share any confidential information. So with all that said, uh, welcome and uh, over to you, Mekka. Thank you, Claire, and thank you for, for a kind introduction as always. And um, today I'm going to be sharing, I'm going to be sort of doing, so that's why it says mapping the maze. I'm going to be sort of signposting to different pots of intellectual property rights that might arise in, uh, in the context of the music industries. But I have shared a link which I found very, very helpful. And one of the most accessible formats to explaining intellectual property rights in the music industries in the UK. And that's in the chat for you. And you can for free download the guide. But hopefully, um, I'll be able to also explain some of the concepts through my own presentation. Now, while I'm also sharing, I would also like to say that we have Elizabeth with us as well. So she's one of our PhD researchers. And she will be today focusing on performers rights. But in the meantime, she's available in the chat if anyone has a comment, a question or something like that. Together with Claire, um, they will be picking up questions. So it's, it's an open format. I have a presentation ready and I have several points that I want to uh, touch on. But we have covered some of the concepts already in the intellectual property series. Um, as part of the online art fest. So where we've discussed certain points in more detail, I will be signposting you to those recordings on YouTube as well. Now, of course, if you have a specific question that you do want to have answered in more detail, we can discuss that as well, either in today's session or you get in touch with us as well. So really this is a, a, an invitation to, to a conversation and let's just start discussing these points. Like I said, performers rights is something that I will be touching on, but Elizabeth is our to-go expert today. So I'm quite happy to share some of the, um, the load, if you will. Uh, so I want to first start with different categories of intellectual property rights. And that is to say, um, without coming to, with any assumptions to this room, as it were, to this audience that perhaps you already know what intellectual property rights are in different categories that we might encounter. So intellectual property rights are legal rights, exclusive rights, which give you monopolies or rights to control certain types of intangible works or intangible creations. So not your phone that you can touch or, you know, an apple you can touch. These are intellectual creations, things like music, things like artistic works, things like commercial symbols. And we have different categories of intellectual property rights that are created by the state. Why does the state have these laws? The aim, at least in theory, the aim or ideally is to protect and promote creativity and innovation in society. So it has a very laudable, a very commendable goal. And the reason why we want to have intellectual property rights is that people who are behind the creative works or innovation get rewarded for their work, they get paid for their work, and that will serve as an incentive for them to continue creating in the future. Now, copyright will protect um, creative works. So that is where most of our effort or our focus will lay today on creative works, things like artistic, dramatic, musical works, and so forth. We then have different intellectual property rights attached to it, and not technically intellectual property rights, but performers' rights or neighboring or related rights. These are rights given to performers over the performances of the creative works. And again, Elizabeth will speak to this in a bit more detail, but I will just start the conversation at the end of this talk. Trademarks are very important uh, intellectual property rights for anyone who is active in the course of trade, so in the market. So if you're selling goods or offering services, you should be thinking about protecting the commercial symbols under which you are trading, so commercial names or other types of distinctive signs. And we had a separate workshop 
on this, which took place in, in early June, and the recording is already available on the YouTube channel. We then have also design rights, and design rights are, again, especially in the European context and now in the UK, they are specific sets of rights which protect the appearance of products. Now, of course, with um, you might be thinking that as a musician, that is not directly related to your work. But if you think of some of the artists like Rihanna and others who do have their own fashion lines, especially because it's the overall branding and creative image they're trying to share with the society and with her fans, appearance of products, whether it's in jewelry line or anything else, might be something to think about as part of your business model. If you're more on the technical side of music, so musical techno technologies, if you're creating, a certain aspect of um, uh, musical, whether it's instruments, software, or other aspects, uh, you might be also interested in patents and the protection of technical innovation, technical solutions to technical problems. Patents are a bit more tricky because they're more expensive to register, but if you are in musical technologies, that might be an area that at least you will encounter going forward. And in this country, we also have limited protection over things like celebrity reputation, goodwill and image. So again, Rihanna, her, her image was taken by Topshop in context of a particular. Uh, so they've put they've taken the photograph of her album, put it on a T-shirt without, of course, her permission. And the courts were stopping that and actually gave um, ruled the case in in um, in favor of Rihanna because there was this false impression of endorsement between Rihanna and Topshop. So we know that celebrity endorsement deals or you know whether it's with musicians and other celebrities that uh, endorsement deals are quite common in the today's market in the today's industry. So you might also be thinking about that if you are at that stage or if you're dealing with somebody who might be famous. So if you're tempted in using somebody's image, you might just want to be using and checking the rules, um, whether or not you can put somebody's picture on a t-shirt and sell it. Okay, so there are specific rules uh, around that and there is a completely separate chapter you could look at under that. Okay, um, Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth and Claire, I do see some comments coming in. If there's a question, feel free to, to sort of stop me if you think it would be a useful. Um, it was actually me that um, I posted something in the chat. I just posted the links to um, all of the talks that you, you, that you just mentioned. Um, so uh, you can just grab the links on there and um, it'll tell you that's straight through them. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you so much, Claire. I think that's uh, it's the best if it happens as soon as I say it and the link is there, I think, for everyone's uh, ease of access, it's the best point. So. With that, I'll just signpost a little bit around copyright. But cop So copyright is definitely an intellectual property right that a musician should be aware of. Um, and some of the key basic rules around copyright are also uh, covered in the, um, not the lectures, they're not lectures, they're workshops, and some of them were quite interactive and we had a lot of audience engagement in them as well. Uh, we've had separate copyright uh, workshops already. I think at least two or three of them have had um, um, quite extensive coverage of copyright. But there are certain key principles that are worth um, repeating or just discussing in any type of conversation around intellectual property and the music industries. So what is copyright? Copyright, one of the important principles to remember is the principle of territoriality. What does that mean in non-law speak, in non-legal terms, is that there is no such thing as a global copyright. You do not have a copyright. However famous you are, you will not have a copyright that will give you protection across the world. Okay. What you have is a UK copyright, you will have a US copyright, and so forth and so forth. So all these systems, all countries across the world, have their own set of rules, that you need to know um, in order to understand whether you have copyright protection in that particular country. Um, so that's one point to remember that copyright is a territorial right. So just because your song is protected in the UK, that does not automatically mean it's protected everywhere else across the world, most notably Europe or, or the US. 
Um, we then also have copyright is a bundle of exclusive rights. So it's like a packet. You have a little bag and you have a mix of uh, rights in there, in that bag, and you can pull them out depending on what other people are trying to do with your work, with your creative work. So these exclusive rights will give you the right to control what happens with the work that is protected by the right. Can you copy that work? Can you sell those copies? Can you put that work online? These are the most typical rights. The right to control these actions belongs to the copyright owner. In the UK, we do not have to register copyright to have protection. So you do not have to go to the intellectual property office and register copyright. In the US, you don't have to register copyright for it to be valid, but if you ever wanted to have protection of copyright in courts, so start litigation on the basis of a US copyright, you would have to register it in the US. So there is a difference in the system itself. Um, copyright is all intellectual property assets. They are valuable assets and companies, especially the ones, the larger companies will have them on their books. And uh, even if you're not, so uh, I'll give you a little uh, anecdote. Even if you're not the one creating the work, you might be, you might need to know copyright rules so that you're not the one infringing or in violation of the law. So today, one of the conversations we had when, when we were sort of doing the speaker prep was, will you be playing any songs? And I said, it's just way too complicated to, to figure out whether or not I would still be in the clear of playing a song and how long it would have to be and what would the purpose of it be in order to, to play the song to the audience and less so when, when it's just us in the room, but we would have to consider that this recording will also be posted on YouTube. And that is a separate audience, and that would be a separate use of the music I would be playing, not just to everyone here, but then later on to anyone viewing the recording. So I said, I don't need that headache, not for today, I'll just signpost everyone and listen in their own rooms in the background, right? So it's also important for us so my, my creative work is this lecture and the uh, copyright owner in this lecture is the university because this is part of my job. Not technically, but it's still close enough to probably fall within that description. Um, but I need to be aware of the rules around music or artistic works that I'm using uh, in my own creative work, which is the lecture itself. So what will copyright protect? In the UK, we have this list system. We have categories of works that will be protected. And the biggest or the, the, the most, the, the largest scope of the broadest scope of protection you will get is if you have created an original literary, dramatic, musical, or artistic work. So the first bullet point where there's a, a splash of color purple. So if you've created a original LDMA work, you have the broader scope of protection, you get, you get the most protection, because not only is your work protected against somebody taking that work, your own work, identical copy, your work is also protected against similar copies. So if somebody were to indirectly copy your own work. We then have a separate set of categories of works that are protected. So these are films, sound recordings, broadcasts, typographical arrangements of published editions. These works are also given copyright protection and exclusive rights in these works, but they're only protected as is. So for example, sound recordings, we'll see that in, in a few minutes, sound recordings are also protected against direct copying. So you can't take the recording of the song. If somebody else makes the recording of the same song, so you do a separate recording of an original composition, there is no violation of rights in that sound recording because it's not the exact recording that you've taken. So if I were to play somebody's song, I find something on YouTube and play it to you, I am actually copying and uh, playing in, in public the actual recording. If I made my own recording, then I'm not infringing that copyright. So there are different types of, um, or the scope of protection is different, but we will see how it all comes together in the music context. So when we had these workshops before and we were looking at artistic works and we were looking at uh, photography and other places, the sound recordings and broadcasts did not feature in our conversations as much. 
today we'll see at least we'll, we'll try to have a bit of a different approach because in the music industry and that's why it's so complex the interaction between different types of categories which all have different people behind them it is quite complex so musical works will be protected if they are original what is original original is author's own intellectual creation and i'll give you a few comments on that and there's some additional requirements when it comes to protecting music so it has to be recorded it has to be fixed that doesn't mean it has to be recorded in a studio it can be written down a musical notation but it has to be recorded fixed in a particular medium and there has to be a link with the uk whether it's because it was published here or the the author is is resident or british nationality one of the there has to be a link with the uk now we start off with the most basic of rights that are relevant to the music industry and discussion here is the protection of songs Okay, so songs are protected as musical works. Okay, so um, you will have composition, musical compositions. These are, if original, these are protected. They're protected for how long? They're protected for as long as the author of the song is alive, plus 70 years after their death. Who is the owner of copyright? It is the author, unless you have one of the exceptions. So. An exception would be if the author is employed and part of their contract, employment contract, is to write this music. So that would be a situation where then it would be the employer having copyright ownership. Or if, whereas the uh, author, the, the person who has composed the music might be the first owner, if they later on transferred their copyright by way of a contract, then you might have again a difference in the position of author and and the owner of copyright now songs composition are just one form of intellectual property right in one type of works relevant we also have a separate copyright in the lyrics and this is different across the world so in in certain systems a song composition together with with the lyrics will be seen as a one whole as one creative work and if you think about it um what people if you were to sort of walk around in 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 not in the village but just you know in the street and if you were you know to play a song to them they would probably think that the lyrics and the composition go hand in hand right that is the work under the law you have two separate rights you have two separate creative works or creations one is the musical work itself so the composition the song and this is really the, the most important one when you're thinking then about registering the creative works and having access to the collecting societies to get payments for royalties when songs are play on the radio. But separate to that, you also have protection or copyright in literary works. So that is the lyrics of a song. So in the UK, you have two separate copyrights, intellectual property rights. Sometimes it's quite tricky to to sort of discuss titles uh, some people think that there should be protection in titles of songs um, most commonly in in what we see in cases and in practice is that titles will not have copyright protection okay so rarely would will they meet the threshold of originality so that they are showing that they are um, that there are sufficient creative expressions of the author to meet that threshold. So titles, they will be considered to be a literary work, so a string of words, um, but rarely will be given copyright protection because of lack of originality, which means you can take titles from other songs. You might not want to do that creatively if they are something that um, everyone would be thinking of. Uh, so you might not do it for that reason, but copyright protection rarely falls within titles themselves. And of course, uh, depending on the release, so maybe artwork on the album is the more sort of almost historical form by now, but you can imagine that even on if you have a digital release, you will still have artwork attached to it, right? You will have, whether it's on your blog or platform or whatever, you have artwork in digital form that would be linked to the album. If that is the case, 
again, you can look at some of the copy, um, copyright workshops that we had around graphic works. I think there was one called fine art and so forth, where protection of artistic works was really at the focus. And we've discussed that uh, quite extensively as well. So there's several pockets. So when you look at songs and albums, you have all these different protections. Now, of course, I already said, if you have a celebrity behind creating a music, you might be thinking also about their reputation, goodwill. Can you use that particular image? If you're thinking about being active and selling merchandise as part of your who you are as, as a creator, uh, you have to think about branding and, and trademarks. So um, the music industry is rich with intellectual property uh, exploitation and knowing the rules, at least first sort of hearing about them, and then maybe going in more detail, depending on who you are, what you do, what is your practice, of uh, figuring out the rules as they are related to you. So one of the ways, so yes, you can create songs and then just release them on different digital platforms, but you have composers who will also do, do work specifically for film, so they will create original compositions there. Or some people are quite uh, skillful in uh, placing their songs for syncing, so for use in different, um, uh, with different film or different kind of uh, creative works altogether. So there are different ways of using it. Once you know what your practice is, because it need not be in the course of trade, you might be separate to that. But once you know that, you can look at the rules that are relevant to you in a bit more detail. So just a note on originality, and I do apologize. I think by now Claire uh, will be able to speak to what originality is, because I think Claire, how many times we've said originality so far, right? Yeah. Is it is it something that is um, sort of at least in terms of your own practice? Is it now sort of clear what originality would be? Um, yeah. So um, you, it's got to be a percentage that is quite different to um to anything else that that would be deemed similar um yeah I've forgotten what the percentage is I'm sorry no, I didn't I didn't mean to put you on the spot see so Claire is now reacting to me always putting her on the spot and I didn't mean to do that oh no, that's okay um, but uh, so Claire, you do installation art, right? Or or multidisciplinary yeah. or um, um, site specific as well. Yeah, yeah, so, site specific. So for you, what would be some of the creative choices you have when you? So let's say you have a completely new project. What would be some of the initial creative choices you would be making? Um, in terms of it being different to anybody else's. You know? No, no, just just you know project completely new, fresh start, what are the creative choices? So I'm thinking probably the place where it will happen, the materials you'll be using, these kind of things, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, audience interaction, um, that's that's um, very key to site-specific work. And um, safety as well, because, um, you know, you, if, it, if it is a, a public place, then you have to consider that. Um, and also longevity of the work and what are you intending for it to be long lasting or is it ephemeral and you know if it rains it will wash it all away or and again that's to do with what materials you use so there are a lot of a lot of <laughs> complicated things um, with site specific work yeah mm -hmm. absolutely. So um, uh, to everyone in the audience, I don't know if anyone wants to share their own creative choices when they're either writing songs or if we have performers in the room, what are the creative choices when they're interpreting a song? If anyone wants to share or pop it in the chat box. But what we've done with Claire was, you know, what are the creative choices of the author in her own medium? So of course, this wouldn't apply to, to music, not, not completely, uh, but audience interaction, definitely. Is there a specific response you're hoping to achieve? But usually it would be, is it, you know, uh, is it meant to be played for a particular, particular instrument? What is the setting? Is it slow? Is it fast? How is it all going to be combined and so forth and so forth? So these creative choices, this print, this this fingerprint of the author 
is what we see when the author expresses her creativity in an original manner and achieve result, a result which is an intellectual creation. This is the threshold. So copyright is not interested in protecting good art, good music, music that is celebrated by uh, reviews or, or in a particular show or you know has sold a particular number of well, I'm not going to say copies, but has been streamed a, a particular number of times and so forth. The threshold or the level at which your work will be protected, your music or artwork or literary work, for that matter, is whether or not there have been a string of creative choices made by the author. So remember that, that it's not about art that we find in museums or, you know, but the same notion, uh, songs that are played or, or music that is played in, in concert halls and, you know, in a very traditional uh, a manner of, or if you will, there's no specific genre of music that will have um, an upper hand under copyright law, if you will. So that's one of the points we wanted to start with. And then just a quick overview of when you have original works, and works because of their investment, they're also given copyright protection. What are the rights given to them? And the first set of rights are what we call economic rights. And these are the ones that have the best protection, at least in the UK. We will speak to moral rights as well, but these are not as strong in the UK, even though they would be of great interest to the artist because they remain with the artist, even if there was a transfer of economic rights or copyright. So what are the rights given to um, authors who are still owners or owners of copyright? So the first one is really to uh, make copies, copyright. That is the right to make copies of the work. So that's the, the first right of reproduction that is given to, to the copyright owner. The second one is once you have these copies, can you put them in circulation? So that is the right of distribution. We then have a right, which in relation to musical and literary works, together with dramatic works as well, is performance in public. And this is why we have all the PRSs and other collective societies, because when you play music in public, so whether it's songs on the radio, when you're at the hairdressers, or it's somebody streaming music into a bar or cafe, or me playing music to everyone here or putting it on YouTube. So performance in public is the uh, music played to people who are there. So me playing something on the radio to, to my, let's say, clients. And let's say I would have a law firm if I do not pretend today to be a hairdresser. OK. Um, if, however, we're putting things where they're, ma they're made available to consumers to users to access at their own um, whenever they wish to, so the right to access it, not when they're there, but whenever they want to, that is the right we call communication to the public. So it's a separate right. And that right is something we're really keen on understanding as creators in the music industry today, because it covers everything that happens both on the radio and on the internet as well. Music streaming is one of the bigger ones where we were hoping that musicians would be making a better earning, a better living, but it's currently debated in the UK in the parliament and the bill, the music streaming bill will be read. The second reading will happen on the 3rd of December this year. So perhaps there are changes coming um, based on the scope of rights given. Okay, so having copies is the right controlled by the copyright owner. Distribution of those copies, so selling copies. So that's in back, back in the day, that would be you make a CD that's making a copy and then selling the CDs in a store, that's distribution. And then performance in public is when you put on a concert and uh, the renting and lending, that would have been if you had the old video stores and other, I don't even know if it was a thing to sort of be lending out CDs probably part of the library collections that was an option that you could take them out, borrow them. And today really communication to the public. So imagine putting things on a platform and you can play that song, right? So despite there being a large or great discussion and it's quite controversial what a stream is, 
um, the streaming right would probably fall, at least in the UK context, under the communication to the public right. Okay, there are different discussions around it. If anyone is interested, I can signpost you to, to further reading and further materials, but I'll leave it at that. The right of adaptation is something that is very important in the context of musical and literary works. With music, it's different arrangements, so that is a separate right. You have to have permission to do that. Um, but again, I'm not speaking in exactly in the musical terms, but it's something we can work on maybe together. But to give you a uh, example from the literary works, if I have written a novel, the right of the adaptation means that if you want to translate that from English to Jap Japanese, you need to have my permission to do that. So the right of the adaptation chain uh, covers translations of literary text, for example, from one language to another. Yeah, so you can't do that without the author's permission. And in music, it, it covers different arrangements as well. Okay, so who has these rights? We've already spoken a little bit, and we're coming now to, to, to that area of, right, you, you now know which rights are, or what you can control, but how do you know when have you gone a step too far? Right. So you're aware that other people have the right to control copies and you shouldn't be copying other people's work. But where do we know is the line between um, take, so we know if we're taking the exact works, we know that the copyright will be engaged. But what if we're making indirect copies? So we're making something similar, not taking the exact works themselves. So um, the test or what the courts will look at is whether or not what you have taken is a substantial part of the originally protected work. And this is really where it sort of comes into play, understanding what is this substantial part, what you have taken. In, in Europe, they say, have you taken part of that original expression? And that's really where the UK has gone after, um, especially after some cases in, in the EU haven't been decided, where it will now turn after Brexit, we'll have to see. But for us, this substantial part test is still a qualitative assessment. So it is not about the percentage of the work you've taken from other people. It's whether or not you have imitated, not only been inspired by, or what we refer to this idea expression dichotomy. So ideas themselves are not protected in copyright. What is protected is expression of that idea. Mecca, can I ask a question there? Um, what about when um, people sample music um, within, uh, obviously, a, a new a new record, a new a composition? But there's, you know, there are a lot of sampled records. So I mean, again, I guess they would have to have, all, you know, the authorization to do that. But is there, um, is it a flat? you would absolutely have to have authorization to do it or is there a like that sort of um you know because it's a it's a new expression of of a of a creative performance that that they can kind of get a not get away with it but you know they can use it so with recordings if you take so with sampling if you take any part of a recording so for rem remixing or sampling you do need to take a license yeah. And, and that's somewhere towards the end. It, but the way to do that has been made much simpler. So it's the collective societies that sort of have a, a set scheme. And then you can sort of work out who you need to pay what. Mm -hmm. um, but just because you're sort of mixing it and creating a new expression, it doesn't mean it, it, you're allowed to do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but that's, that's because you're really um, using the recordings themselves. If, and, and we're coming to that now, right? If, if you're actually using the same musical blocks, so you're, you're trying to say within a set style or you're part of the same school, you're inspired by certain school of artists that came before you, or you say, I'm gonna go back to the 1920s because that particular sound really appeals to me. If you're just using those building blocks, but you're doing it in your own creative yeah. expression, yeah. then you're fine. So yeah. it's really, it depends on what what you're doing but you're absolutely right that um, sometimes it's it's tricky because it would be so helpful to have a clear set of rules right if you take three seconds you're fine if it's four seconds you're in trouble so 
that's not how the law works. And that's why we've been talking about this substantial part uh, so, so often. But I will signpost you also to some of the relevant or useful guides and materials. And one of them is the link I've already posted in the chat. That IPO guide is really, really helpful. It will give you quite a bit of um, guidance going forward. Um, we do have one question, Mekri, if that's Go ahead. Um, yep. so from Mr. Brown, um, he says, what if you play a song in your hairdressers, for example, um, that you've created yourself, like you've made the song, um, but it's streaming or it's on, a, you know, it's playing on a CD or something like that? No, if it's your own work, you know, it's, it's fine. Okay. You don't owe, I mean, you, you can pay yourself royalties, but um there is however with with the uh, songs you're playing so unless you have your own creations original songs if you're ever playing other people's materials you will the prs will will ask you to to pay the fees because it also when you're creating the song that's great but did you all did you also play all of the performances so did you perform all parts of it because performers need to be paid for their performances as well and that includes featured artists and also sessional musicians or non-featured artists and that's why one of the practical tips really is to to get into the schemes of collective management societies prs and really just register with them uh, once you're sort of part of that once you've started creating your work and you know it's being played as well okay thanks for that question um, no more at the moment. Perfect. Um, so this is just the idea expression they caught on me. This is just a point around, you know, if I were to ask everyone now to draw a sunflower, how you would do that, whether you would even do a sunflower or whether you would just have a splash of yellow paint, or you would actually play something that makes you feel happy or light or, or very comfortable and say, that's a representation of a sunflower to me, or you would actually create a, a movement of it. How we do the idea of sunflower in the physical world, what is the expression? Copyright will protect the expression, not the uh, idea. But of course, how does it work in music, right? Because it's all nice and dandy that we're talking about sunflowers, and that's a starting point, but how does it work in, in music? So when you're looking about songs, and we're now talking about original songs, compositions, the music we hear, how will the courts approach compared to different songs? Um, it's still substantial part test, so it's not just about having identical copies of the work. And yes, maybe in the past it was more linked to also, you know, is the melody the same? If me and Claire were listening to songs and, and listening to them and say, oh yeah, that sounds exactly the same, that is that the test? So you just sort of um, give the, the music to, to general, bystanders and they will tell you if it's the same copyright infringement if it's not so how do we assess that right two songs they sound similar is it a copyright infringement yes or no and of course it's it's so difficult to draw that line just like we said is somebody's work inspired by something or is it an imitation and a step too far now what what we've seen and of course i'll just signpost here we've discussed copyright exceptions as well and the one that could be relevant also to the note that um claire was making around sampling is the pastiche exception so that goes together with a, a parody exception of fair dealing uh, and that's a separate area that we could explore um because we haven't had many cases in 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 actual courts but prestige has been argued by some scholars to be the the um the ignored exception that could really work well in the music industry but apart from that the first step we have two songs one was created before the other how do we assess whether or not there is actually infringing copies now uh, not to get in hot water i'm not going to be playing these songs in front of you but if you want as we're speaking through this you can start playing them in the background you see everything that is in green is people who started the lawsuit so they said we've created the songs first and you came after us and you've copied our work and we want to have compensation. We want, we want the courts to say that that was a violation of copyright law and we want damages. All three cases that we have here are from the US, 
but it's to make a point about comparing songs. Okay, so the first one was actually a successful case. So copyright infringement was found. And if you play Got to Give It Up and Blurred Lines, you can decide first on your on your own if you think that that is actually a copy that should have been stopped or is it really just a matter of that the similarities between the two songs is something that is used quite commonly in the trade right in 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 music now i can tell you from a legal standpoint because i'm not here to to <laughs> to lecture on musicology because i do not know anything about it uh, I'm not even going to pretend I don't know enough. I know nothing about it. Um, so I, I can't speak to, to the musicology side of things. What I can tell you is the decision in the Blurred Lines case, where millions of dollars have been awarded as damages, first was really, really shocking to everyone in the industry in the sense that people were not really aware. So what now? Is all creative endeavors stopped for fear of being on, of infringing copyright whenever you're creating music. So as long as something is similarly sounded, are you gonna be in trouble? And we see that then in cases. So everything is that is in green is claimant. So it's people starting the lawsuit and all the red ones are people who were sued, right? So blurred lines was, they were sued and actually here the copyright case prevails. So they had to pay money. Then the following on cases, which happened after the Blurred Lines case, so Stairway to Heaven was in hot water for copyright infringement and then Dark Horse by Katy Perry in the same way. So Stairway to Heaven was, they were um, in oh, hot water is from this, for the starting uh, court. So how, how the song starts. And they said it sounds very similar to, to Taurus, the song by Spirit and Randy Wolf. Now, of course, when the courts were then assessing this, is it actually a copy or is it just sharing similar influences, sharing common, and here the court said common musical building blocks, how we write songs. And that's why I would invite you, if you haven't had a chance to look at this on YouTube in the past, there's actually some really helpful YouTube videos where there's a guy with a guitar and he will tell you based on this case, he will tell you what are the similarities and what are the differences. And again, from a legal standpoint, it's very helpful to know that when the court will find that the similarities between the two songs are nothing more but the common musical building blocks or common musical elements, then these are not protectable expressions in copyright and there will be no copyright infringement. How will you as a lawyer know what are common musical expressions or elements? You ask the experts. So I would say everyone in this room who is in music, give me your opinion. So experts will tell you about chord progression, uh, interpretation style and all of that and how different instruments are used and so forth and so forth. And the use of musicologists, so forensic musicologists is now very common here in the UK as well. But of course, you can imagine that litigation already as a starting point is very ex expensive. And then having all these experts on top will be very expensive. And it's in these contexts that the backing of a record label, which has you know, substantial access to funds, is a particular advantage over somebody who, who doesn't have that backing you know, in lawyer fees, in accounting fees, in access to all the different experts in musicology and so forth and so forth. So the two cases that came after Blurred Lines, their way to have an and Dark Horse, and Dark Horse was actually not even about the, the common chord elements and how that was interpreted. It was about the underlying, the use of the underlying beat. So if you play Dark Horse and Joyful Noise without knowing there was a case, unless you're sort of really uh, paying attention to that, you might even miss it. But uh, Katy Perry had to go to the appellate court. So at the first instance, so the first time they went to court, there was a jury there. And when they heard all the evidence, they actually made her pay $2.78 million in compensation for copyright infringement. <laughs> and I'm watching Claire's face. Yes, absolutely. It's horrendous, isn't it? It's the You can't even imagine if somebody, if you're not having this backing by a record label or a huge organization with say, Katie, don't worry we'll get the experts on it, there's nothing to worry about. So 
probably not the best of experiences, but at least you know you have a team, team backing you up. If, however, you're an artist, just doing your own thing or emerging, and somebody just threatens you with a lawsuit like this, it's very debilitating. It, it, it's not something to even, you know, think of easily navigating. Um, but there are other ways you can you can think about mediation and other aspects as well, perhaps to start a conversation. But cases like Stairway to Heaven and Dark Horse are very helpful because at least they say they've sent out the signal that if the experts would say it's common musical elements, the building blocks, then uh, there will be no copyright infringement. And I guess what is a step too far? How do we all approach it? I, you know, musicians, just like any other human beings, there's probably so many different ways of looking at what is too far, what is too similar, what is copying, what is expression. Billie Holiday had a completely different view, right? She, she, there's nothing to say to suggest that, you know, um, oh, there's so many similarities, we're all standing on the same shoulders and we're, no, you know, if you copy, it means you're working without any real feeling. It was a completely different approach to music, right? So the only thing I can say is that in law, the test is substantial part. Have you taken the original expression of the author of the composer? And how the courts will assess that is looking at the quality of what was taken, so the similarities, and whether or not that was the expression taken from the original work, it will depend on what the experts will say. So lawyers will ask the court, the judges will ask musical, musicology experts to advise them on whether what was taken is common in music. It's something everyone does when they're writing um, compositions in this particular genre or not. So it's not going to be judges just listening there. Yeah, I think they sound the same. Yeah. Let's give them minutes. So it's not going to work. Not now anyway. Um, and at least in this country, we don't have jury trials in civil court cases. Okay. Um, Claire, I'm just checking if there are any questions or um, if, yeah. Oh, well, uh, Jackie just made a, a comment um, when we were talking about hairdressers and streaming the music in the hairdressers. Um, she just made a comment that the hairdresser can only play the music if they have the PPL PRS license, which is the music license. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it's one of those things when I was sort of not growing up, but when I started working, not in this country, but in, in Slovenia, I started working and most of our copyright cases were really the equivalent of PPL and PRS back home, suing everyone for not paying their licenses for, for just public performances of songs. So, and that's why we have the collective management of, of these rights is because individually, Nobody, you wouldn't be able to know if somebody in Leeds is playing your song if you're from Bristol and you're just, you know, going about your life. So it's not effective to put that burden on individual artists. But yes, the, the organizations themselves, they, they are quite skilled and, and um, they, they will come after you if you don't have that. So um, technically, there's nothing to prevent you from, from not paying for the license, but once discovered, you, you will be in breach, in violation of copyright laws. Yeah. Um, Mecca, you know, you mentioned um, briefly just about uh, genres. I mean, does that have any effect on, um, you know, on anything? If you were to use, or if you were to have a similar piece of music, but, it, but the original one was in a different genre of music to the one that you were sort of using it for, does that come into play at all? Um, legally or or is it really just uh i don't know what i'm trying to say does that make sense yeah, yeah. so of, i i think you're asking me about the from whose perspective are we viewing what was taken so imagine you're taking just a particular hook from one song and it really yeah. features heavily in there but in the second one because it's a different genre it just yeah. plays maybe it's part of the introduction maybe yeah. it's sort of somewhere in the middle and might lose some of its strength or you know it's it's a different play on on something that in one genre has a different kind of meaning it doesn't matter what the role is in the second work the qualitative assessment of what you've taken, whether it's exp original expression of the author, that assessment is done through the eyes or from the perspective of the original song. 
So if in that part, it is a creative choice that is to be attributed to that author, and I guess what would be important is whether or not it's a common musical element that, you know, musicians just use when they're writing and coming up with songs. And I think um, when I was listening to some of the interviews from the musicians that, that were part of, so uh, it, with the Blurred Lies, it, it, it was quite apparent that the way they've created, created certain sounds with cowbells and other things and sheet, and he was then even doing that, you know, he had a sheet of paper and wah, 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 so that particular sound as well. That's something they've come up on their own back then. And, and then the combination of all of that had a really strong impression on the jury. And of course, it always depends also on, you know, where, where is the, where are the experts now? What, what is their opinion? But I can only say when it comes to whether or not something would count as a infringing copy, I can only tell you the test. And I would have to ask the musical, musicologists, the experts. Beyond that, I'm just sort of guessing because my expertise lies in law, not, not in musicology of this. So if anyone wants to comment on any of these cases or if anyone has had a chance to play it in the background, by all means, you're welcome to contribute here uh, at this junction. <laughs> okay, tried, tried my best, did, did a little yeah. bit. Of <laughs> But maybe, maybe at the end, we'll see. So uh, I did want to uh, just make a point around, you know, sunk, sunk covers, because I've had a question in one of the past workshops, and I didn't have a, a spiffy posh uh, response or just a correct response, really. And I do think if we have performers in the room or just people trying to, you know, uh, think about how, how it really all works or trying to put show off their skills, whether it's as performers or, or a different kind of sets by performing other well-known uh, artists' songs, how does it all work, is I thought it might just be helpful to signpost to certain rules. And uh, so if you're doing a live cover of a song, you don't have to, you yourself don't have to pay anything because it's the venue that has to pay royalties and has to take out a license to PRS anyway. So the venue will take care of that, the burden is on them. If, however, you're trying to record a cover of a song, you can do, uh, but it will not extend this, so this option will not be available if you're making a music video. But if you're trying to record a cover of a song, you will need to take out a cover song license and that's with the mechanical, so that's the MCPS, so that's the mechanical licensing part together the mcps and prs together they form prs for music so it's all available on the same website if you're trying to search for more detail on that and we do then have um, the note also on remix and samples so you do have to have a license when you're using other people's recordings okay um, it's just best to, to check with the PRS and PPL to actually see how you get the license. And in most cases, you do have these, what they're called compulsory licenses. So you see the compulsory in brackets for cover song license. That means that people can't say, no, you can't do it, right? Uh, the system is already put in place that if you want to do a cover, you can do, but you will have to pay a fee to do that. And how do you do that? It's all managed collectively. So in a way, it's easier to get access to that, but it's not free. Right? So, so that's just something that I wanted to maybe add here uh, on top of the original work. So just how it works with uh, covers. And it, it is worth checking the rules. So if you were ever thinking of doing things in the US, they do have some different rules there as well. So, and that goes back to that all intellectual property rights are in essence territorial rights. So that's a really important point to remember, just because you know how it works here in the UK does not necessarily mean you will know the correct approach and answer for the US. Um, Rebecca's just asked a question. Um, oh. if, I, if I was to do a cover of a song on YouTube, yeah. would that be okay or would I need a license? Well, you need a license, it's not live. So um, live is just you either playing in a theater or, or at a venue, so just because it's online live, it, it doesn't mean it's, so it's it's the platform. Now, of course, if you're doing it live streaming and it doesn't remain there available, 
we would have to check. But my guess is that the online medium is different to the um, actual live venues. And yes, you would have to have a license. Uh, and but how, do, how do we get the license? Do, do you know? You just go to MCPS. I do have, um, it's very easy. I have some links as well um, okay. here, but you can literally just go to the PRS for music and say cover song license. So just say how to get cover song license and the MCPS and PRS links there, how to get it, because you will need a permission, a license from MCPS. Uh, and they have a very easy step-by-step -step process laid out. Right, thank you. Okay, more rights. Um, they're not extensive, and I wish they were a bit bigger or or more more helpful to to the musicians, to the artists. So why the reason why they're such a promising prospect is that moral rights are always given to the author of the creative work. So here it would be musical work or literary work or depending on whatever you're creating. So moral rights remain with the author, even if you transfer copyright. So even if you have a contract and it says, you know, you're sort of assigning copyright to whether it's a record label or whoever, if you don't transfer moral rights, they, they remain with you. And moral rights, really the two that I think are very helpful is one is that you're recognized as the author. So the person who's created the work. So that's called the right of attribution. And the other one is that you would have the right of integrity. So that is the right to object to derogatory treatment of the work. So uses by other people that could harm your honor or a reputation. Uh, again, this is a very specific right and um, we'll, we'll leave it also to Elizabeth to touch on it. So this is also the right, these moral rights are also given to performers. So what, what people can do with performances when they are likely to harm the reputation of performers. But like I said, in the UK, these rights, they're written in the statute, but they're not very strong because of the way they're approached and interpreted by the courts. And also it's possible to sign them away through a contract. So it's important to read contracts from this part as well, so that you will know if you're signing away moral rights, that you will at least know what you're giving uh, up or you know you can decide whether you want to do that or not. So moral rights is something to keep in mind. Now, I'm not going to go into too much specifics around sound recordings, but sometimes you'll hear different expressions. So sound recordings is something that we find in the act here in the UK, um, but it's also referred to in the US and other contexts as phonograms, and we find that in the international framework as well. So what do we protect? So this is the actual recording. So when, when you, are, you have a producer and they record, the musical composition, the song, it will have a separate copyright attached to it. The sound recording is protecting, like we said, as is, so the actual sound recording. And that's why you also sometimes hear those masters, right? How important it is, who has control over the master recordings and what can happen with those. And these are exclusive rights. Again, um, you have the right of making reproduction, playing in public and so forth. So that's why you have not only PRS, but you also have PPL, which is another collective management association or society organization that deals with all the rights attached to phonograms or sound recordings. So you have to pay royalties to that. And this is really where a lot of the market power rests because usually the rights owners of sound recordings are the record labels, the three majors, the Sony Universal and Warner and this is where we've seen so much of discussion around music streaming because they are the ones really making most of the money in the music streaming business. Why? Because, because they're the rights owners in sound recordings. Of course, there are other contracts attached to that, but still. So who is the owner in copyright and sound recordings? It is the producer and the pr producer is considered um, to be the author and by extension, the first owner of copyright. The producer is, um, uh, the person putting everything in place so that the recording happens. So I, we've heard that um, producer is sometimes seen differently from musical standpoint, but from a legal standpoint is producer is, and that's why you'll see the record labels often being considered producers in this context, 
producer is the person who puts everything in place for the sound recording to to happen right um, and you see that it lasts between 50 and 70 years either from when it was made or when it was first published now why is it so hard to follow all these rules right not only do we have separate copyright in the composition in the lyrics in the artwork attached to it potentially in titles we also then have separate copyright attached to the sound recordings themselves in things if things are broadcasted through tv or other places think about a concert you will have broadcasting rights as well if there is merchandising attached you'll have trademarks you'll have branding if you have bigger players as well you might have celebrities you might have things to think about there um, under goodwill endorsement deals and things like that so it's a very complex field and there's so much money involved as well when you're thinking about uh, the commercial exploitation by the big record labels right so there's a lot attached or there's a lot to think about in this particular um field how does it all work how do we how do people make money through this so um commercial exploitation is what we refer to when we're talking about making money out of music so how do you commercially exploit it you do it through contracts so if you're the author of the composition you're considered to be the first owner but you can transfer ownership in copyright how by signing a contract right you would uh, assign let's say uh, copyrights whether it's to a publisher or to a um, record label or whoever right so the way to 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 do that is through contracts so that's one side of things but we also have certain rights of um, um, performance in public for example that are managed collectively and that's why it's very again very important if you are part of the industries to look into and think about registering with PRS for music and PPL for recordings when you're creating that work that you're planning to put out there in the public domain. Okay, and I've already mentioned there's so many different um, aspects. So if you were to think about putting on a big show as well, when you might be thinking about costumes and, and different aspects, visual aspects as well, uh, you might also be looking at design rights, which we had a separate workshop on as well. Now, because this is such a difficult area of the industry or different difficult um, field to navigate the university is exploring different options of maybe helping the students and the graduates sort of navigate this field and what i'm doing here now is if you do have any suggestions or needs that are not being met whether it's by way of workshops whether it's by um, an ideal record label would offer me this a list of services you would want just drop me an email we are looking and there's going to be separate workshops attached to this and everything but if you have any ideas around what a record label for you so placed here in the local community uh, what you would need to get from that record label or or non-profit organization just drop me an email we do we are thinking and there are plans being made around that as well now, before I conclude, I'll just make two points. So one, one is just I'll signpost to performers, right? But it is something that uh, Elizabeth will be picking on. So performance rights, again, they are given to people who act, sing, deliver plays, uh, or otherwise perform a literary, dramatic, or musical work. So today I'm a performer because what am I performing? A literary work. So a lecture is a literary work. It wouldn't normally qualify for copyright protection um, when I am lecturing at the university, but today is being recorded, so all the requirements of copyright protection are actually met. So um, performance rights are given to to all performers of literary, dramatic, or musical works, and you can imagine that that is relevant in the music industries. And we might have some some performers with us today. We can see that when we come to, to a more practical session as well. But what are these performance rights? So first you have to be asked for permission, you have to give consent to the actual making of the recording. And then later on, when people are making copies and everything, uh, you will have to be paid as a performer on that exploitation of the recordings as well. So there are economic rights given to performers. 
and there are more rights also given to performers. So both the right to be recognized as the performer, the right of attribution, but also the right to stop derogatory treatment. So if something were to harm the reputation of the performer. You can see it's not as long as copyright, but still it's not that short either. So it's 50 to 70 years since performance or public release of the recording. And of course the, um, the PRS and the collective management societies are again, the ones that are sort of collecting royalties to be paid when the recordings of performances are shown in public. So it's not on you as a singer to go and follow everyone who's played and show the recording of your performance. Uh, it is actually the collective management societies that are in charge of that. And of course, when you have non-featured artists, and there were some numbers put around that, um, when people have to pay the, the fees for public performances or recordings, um, the, the, there is a percentage of 20% that has to be uh, sent to the fund for non-featured artists or sessional musicians. And then that gets distributed by the collective management society itself. If that doesn't happen, if that particular um, um, entity doesn't pay that 20%, then the, the artist can go and say, you have to pay that. So it, there's a whole process behind that. Okay, but performers, right, like I said, we'll leave that with Elizabeth. And finally, I do have just some practical signposting. So I promise I stopped talking now around the content of copyright. It's more just connecting you to points you might want to explore a little bit further. So first is, um, there's this whole thing now around registering your, your music. So when you register and you, you start, of course, in this country with PRS, but then you have PPL as well. Um, when you register a song, you get like a number, and I forget, it's, it's a huge number. Uh, you get a number that is a unique identifier, identifier for that song. And that is very, very helpful and needed for all the royalties to be kind of correctly collected and then distributed for your songs having been played in, in public. So of course you see that PRS also, so you will have to become a member, but it also gives you a whole step-by-step -step on why would you want to become a member, how much it costs, and also uh, the process of registering works, everything is explained cl quite clearly um, online. The second tip is something that was created last or started last May, May 2020. It is a way of keeping digital records of when you've created songs. So everything we were talking with Claire around songs and substantial parts and all of that, in copyright law, there's something that is called a defense of independent creation. And in fact, Katy Perry, in, 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 when she was giving evidence, she said she's never heard of the other song before creating the Dark Horse song. If she could actually prove that, it would be a successful defense. So having a record of when you've created your work can be very helpful. And WIPO, so that's the World Intellectual Property Organization, has responded to this practical need and has created this. So it's called WIPO Proof. You go online. Again, it, it might not be something you're really interested in or want to explore further, but if it is part of your practice going forward and you are interested in keeping track records and you will see, I think there's, I don't know how much are Swiss francs worth in pounds, but one digital certificate, which later on looks like this. So you get a certificate of your full code and everything for the song. So it will be a proof of when the song was created. So let me give you an example. I create this certificate for a song I've created today. In two years time, I'm sued for copyright infringement because Claire said that she's created a song and I've copied it. And Claire says, I've created my song in September, 2021, and it's a hugely popular song and you've copied it and look at the, all these similarities. And I would say in response to that, Claire, but I've created my song already in June, 2021. So before you made yours public, never heard yours, and the courts would say, well, can you prove it? If I had the certificate to say that I've done my recording of the song or that I've created a song in June 2021, then case over. All of that assessment, are they the same, similar, blah, 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 all of that goes away, okay? So again, this is a practical tip, right? So how has practice responded to this need of 
who has created something first. This is one way. Another tip is this, and this is just a few slides from, I've sent the links, there is a downloadable PDF, it's for free. This to date, and I've been reading so many different books as well, that try to explain copyright laws and different intellectual property rules in, in the music industries, some more successfully than others, because it's difficult for all this technical detail to, to really cover it in a way that is accessible. I mean, I've attended so many different, even performers' rights, and I always get a headache around where you should register, what is the difference between the performance license, the mechanical license, and the terminology is also not used consistently. So lawyers say something, the industry is saying something, so it's difficult to really make heads and tails. And this, music, music copyright explain, you will see there's more slides than this, I think this is a very, very digestible format of giving you the rules as they are now. And if you look at the PDF, you also have explanation around the different collecting societies, the different licenses and payments you will be getting, including for music videos, including for you know, plays on radio, music streaming. So this is a really, really helpful format of explaining IP when they have to do with, with music, so playing songs. And you will also see the way it's structured. They will tell you how the industry speaks of this. They will say act stuff. So that's the lawyer stuff, the, what you find in the Copyright Design and Patents Act. And I really do recommend this. And if anyone's interested, once you've had a look and if you want to chat about any aspect of this further, by all means, just get in touch. The final suggestion is for any women musicians, whether identifying as such or gender minority artists, if you just want to create, join the F list and create your own listing, it's for free. It's a directory of all UK based musicians. Um, so people identifying as women or, or gender minority artists, you're welcome to join us as well. And this sort of concludes my first bit or my talk, as it were. Um, but we will be starting music IP series in the fall onwards as well. So if you have any areas where you want us to zero in, focus on anything, by all means, let us know. Want to get in touch, drop me an email or get in touch through Twitter. You can do. I'm still around. And if there are any questions, we can sort of touch on them with Claire. But for now, Oh, Claire, either we can go into questions as Elizabeth is. Uh, yeah, we've got, there's a, couple, there's a couple of items in the, uh, Perfect. In the chat. And we can... so, um, oh, I've just lost the chat. Where's it gone? <laughs> oh no, I've just lost it. Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, I'll come back to yours in a second, Rebecca. So Mr. Brown says on, on PPL, it asks for a tax form for us and it says individual sole trader or limited company or partnership. Is that form easy to do if you're an independent artist? So for I the have, registration form. I have no idea, but we can look into that. Okay. So I don't want to be, so this is a very practical thing and I would love to explore this more. And that's okay. why I think it's so helpful to, you know, if there's a need to look into these kind of things, we can sort of think about maybe putting up a separate workshop if needed, maybe even have a partnership with the FLS PRS or whatever, wherever the need is. But definitely it's one of those things, right, that once we have a non-profit non -profit organization, whether it's a record label, we're still searching for the name, um, uh, once we have that set up, it's something we would help with, with, with all our students, graduates, or, you know, local talent as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I agree that these forms, so I've made this comparison and I think the more I say it, the more I believe it, which is a little bit ominous, isn't it? That I believe my own sayings, but um, <laughs> it, it's like taxes. You think you will ever figure it out, but, but it's just so like, you, you move this way and you think, yeah, I got it now, but, but you really don't. So, yeah. no, so I agree, there's definitely need to look into these technicalities as well. And they change as well with time. So there's not, yeah. but we can definitely look into that. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so back to Rebecca, um, just talking about the uh, licenses for YouTube. Um, she said that she just looked it all up on the, the PRS license. Um, for anyone who want, who's looking to do covers on YouTube. 
um, and it says that you should be covered as long as um, they have their own license agreements in place. <laughs> well, YouTube is notoriously tricky. Uh, if if you sort of want to see um, uh, the, the rich relationship between YouTube and the music industry, you just look at the streaming debate in the UK. And in fact, how YouTube, and obviously YouTube will say that they, they, they make sure that they have all the required licenses in place. So, you know, in that sense, if you just follow whatever they tell you to, it, it might be the case. So the answer is you might need to have a license unless YouTube has a license, but yeah. I, I can't with confidence say that I know that YouTube has all the licenses it needs to for, for covers of songs. Okay. Um, oh, one from Isaac. Uh, you must probably cover this, but that was a lot of information. So the scenario, I, I, want, I want to remix with Kanye West's album with a different style. What are the steps and implications? So the only thing I could point you to, Isaac, is the, the mentioning of the MCPS. So a cover, uh, not cover, it's a mechanical license you would need for remixes. So you would need to have uh, a license permission to use that part of the uh, Kanye West track that you're trying to use. Yeah. Okay. But, but again, that's something. So I don't want to pretend as if I know every, so the bits I teach to, to lawyers are just the first bits around original works. Then working through, so I'm also on the board of the F list. So working with musicians for, for now over a year and a half, maybe two years, you start picking up all these practical points from the industry as well. And if I agree with everyone, so this is a lot of information, but there's still so much out there and the detail of it, it's a lot to sort of wrap your head around. And that's why artists that have the backing of larger organizations they have that back, but it, it's not free, right? They do have to sign away with their contract, a lot of their earnings, and quite often also copyright. So it's not ideal at all. Mm -hmm. um, but so I, I'm, I'm very keen on when, when sort of people figure out, not black holes, but maybe spots where we need to further investigate the different processes, we can look into doing that maybe in the fall as well. So that's definitely welcome. I just don't pretend to maybe know all the answers today. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that question, Elizabeth. Okay, uh, nothing else at the moment. So, um, Elizabeth, is it over to you? Sorry? Oh. Uh, actually, we have got one more question from Mr. Brown. Um, you know what would be good help creating... Con oh. um, so for contracts? I yeah, for contracts or copyright, for example, how many copies you're allowed? performance rights, exclusive rights, music video with your music. So for uh, for contracts, I can signpost you. So musicians union, once you're a member of the musicians union in this country, you, you get access to their entire da data bank to contracts. Maybe some of them are once uh, when Elizabeth is now chatting, uh, maybe some of them are even available for everyone. So I'll just do a quick check. But musicians union, I know already have access or they uh, I've attended one of the webinars and they said they have a bank of templates for contracts that people might want to use in practice. So I'll do that in the background once Elizabeth is chatting, if that's all right. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Elizabeth, take right. it away. Are you ready? <laughs> Sorry, it's super interesting. I've been on Twitter, like telling people how much you're missing out on like how to gain <laughs> you people. <laughs> um, good. Right. Okay, so hello everyone. By the way, that's Bella Kuti's son. But yeah. Um, hello everyone, welcome. My name is Elizabeth Duarie. I'm um, I'm a PhD researcher in intellectual property law at the university. Um, um, today I'll be talking about um, performance performance rights in Nigeria. And don't worry, I relay back to some UK provisions because I know like, most people aren't familiar with in Nigeria. But yes, um, so these are some Nigerian artists I'm sure someone here would know. Um, just to get familiar with. Um, today I'll be talking on I'll be talking about some of the lacunas in the law and preferring some recommendations that will enhance the effectiveness of the law. 
So yes, the Nigerian um, culture is very dynamic. Um, it's very, very complex in the nation. And the creative industries are also not void of like complexities. Um, the Nigerian music industry is like a stronghold for African popular music and is shaped by powerful words and verbal expressions in both indigenous languages as well as English. And if we're being very, if I'm being very, very honest, um, harmony and um, tuning are actually given secondary importance, um, but it's mostly like, you know, what's being said in the song. Um, some, there's some Nigerian songs that just without like anything in the background or any beats or anything, people already like really relate to what they're saying. So um, very, the music is super is shaped by powerful words and expression. So the most popular genres are um, Afrobeat, Juju, Fuji, Afropop and Afrofusion. Um, I know Burna Boy is big on Afro fusion. He looks at it as like a pizza that has like some Afro beats, some hip hop, some Afro pop. So he's big on that. So listening to, an, to a Burna Boy song, for instance, or an album, you're like, is this Afro beats? Is this Fuji? You're not sure. But yeah, that's really what it's um, Afro fusion is like. Right. So the Nigerian music industry, like Nollywood, which is the Nigerian film industry, very heavy, heavy reliance on themselves with little to no government support. Um, they get their support from like private individuals, organizations, financial institutions. They power the music industry basically. And um, the industry are artists in the Nigerian music industry include artists, composers, um, managers, um, media promoters and distributors. And, and like producers, but producers in the context of what Dr. Medica was saying, which is not your like typical producer who's sitting in the studio making music, you know. So, but I'll I'll get to that. So, um, currently, foreign investors actually um they partner with big players in the Nigerian music industry, and um companies like Apple Music, um Tidal, um Audio Mac, Spotify, they've come to open offices in Lagos, um to explore the growing local music space. So it's the Nigerian music industry has actually like joining a lot of foreign direct investments. So um, to um, performing rights. So I just want to mention that the Nigerian music industry is lacking in structure and, um, in, and also in very strong intellectual property laws, which I'll be touching on yes. today, which I- Elizabeth, yes. uh, out of love, can you slow down a little bit? Uh, we have some Sorry. audience requests and Elizabeth, oh, I should have just done this, but I don't know if you would have seen me. Oh, can you just slow down a little bit? It's very sure. interesting. Just to, um, thank you. I don't know why I can't see any of the, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, um, great. I would speak slow. I just looked at the chat, good. Okay, um, yes, so um, the Nigerian music industry is lacking in structure, I would like to mention. And um, when I say structure, I mean like, you know, having typical and like, you know, properly structured record labels. And um, also it's lacking in strong intellectual property laws when it comes to Nigerian creative industries. And I'll be touching on some of these laws in relation to performers' rights today. So um, neighboring rights, known as other rights, basically, and um, just to they sound relatable, they're developed parallel to copyrights, like Doctor was saying earlier. Um, copyrights are governed under the Nigerian Copyright Act, right? And then um, performers' rights is governed under the Nigerian Copyright Act as well. Um, so copyrights originated in the era, era of printed technology to protect the printing press. Now, and the trend always has been technology precedes protection. So as a result, the growth of technology has stretched copyright protection to new technology development. But um, the Nigerian copyright law follows this same trend, but a slower pace in comparison with other developed countries like the UK. Um, so new technology is transferred to Nigeria after it's been discovered by um, discovered in any of the developed countries. So currently, Nigeria's IP protection regime owes much of much of the much to the development of you know in the international community, particularly the United Kingdom. So neighboring rights can be defined as um, the category of rights granted to performers phonogram producers, like remember what Dr. said earlier about phonograms um, and broadcasters. Um, the position on the Nigerian law is slightly different because neighboring rights under the Nigerian Copyright Act includes performers' rights as expressions of folklore. So just, just, just a difference. Um, 
So a music performer enjoys what is known as performance rights, which is inclu included in the category of neighboring rights under um, section 26 of the Nigerian Copyright Act. And the protection lasts for 50 years from the end of the year in which the performance first took place. So similar to United, the United Kingdom, um, um, in the UK, performance rights are divided into non-property, property rights and remuneration rights. Um, Non-property non rights are basically the control a performer has over his performance. And they include authorization of a live performance, um, the rights to prevent the making of recording of a live performance from a broadcast in which it is included, and um, also the right to um, prevent their live performances being broadcast. So the property rights include the right to make copies, um, to issue copies to the public, to lend and rent and to include performance in and on demand services. So a lot of the Nigerian industry actors actually depend on image and performance rights um, and, and other neighboring rights as secondary jobs. It's, it's a big thing in Nigeria and I think even Africa. And it's because, um, for instance, in Nigeria, the Nigerian government, they don't see the creative industries as viable sources of like you know revenue growth you pay little attention to these creative industries and part, part of what's slowing down these industries and part of why the these intellectual property laws in nigeria aren't as strong as they need to be so um you know like i said also it's this this the the reliance on this this performance right is um, because these industries are heavily reliant on endorsements and the private sector as i i said earlier so um yeah so performance rights are developed parallel to the copyrights um they're parallel to, parallel to copyrights and that's tiwa savage by the way parallel to copyrights and a songwriter or composer owns copyright of the song used in a performance right then the performer has rights over the performance and the recording company has rights over the sound recording used in the performance now the crime under performance rights in nigeria and the nigerian law is unauthorized recording. That's the crime. Um, however, if a recording was carried out with authorization, but illegally produced, the crime is piracy. Um, so yeah, so where the recording was unauthorized and it was illegally reproduced by another, that reproduction is still a crime under the Nigerian Copyright Act. Um, so even when, um, even when the recording is like for your private use, um, you still need consents and it's still required. Although, I mean, if I go to the Beyonce, if I, most people think like, oh, if, I, if I'm going to the Beyonce con concert and I'm recording myself at Beyonce's concert and I, I just want this at home to just listen to and just to have, um, as long as you're not rebroadcasting it or you're not like, you know, um, making money from it, you're safe. But otherwise it's a crime under the Nigerian Copyright Act. But in reality, artists, especially in the Nigerian industry, they, they, they usually don't pursue these acts um, because it's time consuming and because it's sent the um, CMOs in Nigeria don't work as they sh as they should as effective as the United Kingdom as um, Doctor explained earlier. Um, the artists they're not likely to pursue these acts um, because it's time consuming and the circulation on the internet to them it, um, they look at it as additional publicity. So um, that's usually what happens as opposed to here where like prof doctor is saying if it's paid like in the mall or something you know you have to pay you have to get a license in nigeria it's, it doesn't work that way so um i put a sign up here um, i'm sure you've seen that when you go you've gone to like um a lounge or something these aren't just for flashlights distracting performers performing it's usually so you don't be broadcast or you don't like you know circulate it and make money from it so it also does have a copyright angle as well as having like you know health angle like you don't want flash and the performance face faces and then they fall and then they can't do their jobs properly and entertain you so um Prior to the 21st century in Nigeria, performers were, were not concerned with the fixation of public performances by unauthorized, per, by unauthorized persons because such acts rarely occurred because te technology wasn't like a big thing in Nigeria at the time. But all they're concerned with was monetary reward. And I'm um, sorry, I think, am I getting anything in the chats if I'm still talking so fast? You're, you're okay, Elizabeth. Uh, but yes, it's always a good thing to to just pace yourself. Yes. <clears throat> um, great. Okay. So yeah. Um, so um, 
all the concerned Nigerian artists at the time, people in the music industry, industry actors, all that they were really concerned it was monetary reward for their performances by the organizers. So the performer was theoretically able, theoretically able to exercise control over their audience at the time and location of the performance. But the situation obviously has changed now with you know, technology transfer into Nigeria and performance has lost its transitory um, status. So um, performers perceive bootlegging, which is actually unauthorized recording duplication and distribution of live performances as a problem for the recording company or individual who records that performance. So the act of bootlegging, which is actually like um, um, recording to sell, resell in Nigeria, which is not piracy. So bootlegging is when you go to a concert, you record the whole concert as opposed to people going to buy and watch these concerts later, you reproduce it and you sell it. So that's bootlegging in this context. So um, in comparison to piracy, it doesn't constitute a predominant, predominant practice in Nigeria. However, it poses a significant threat to creative um, practices in Nigeria, uh, creative and endeavors in Nigeria. So um, it's an infringement of the performer's rights by a person who, without the performer's consent or authorization in writing, makes a recording of the whole or substantial part of a live performance. So um, actors, film producers, musicians, and recording companies in Nigeria, they in the past have actually lamented over um, piracy and bootlegging. In fact, in 2009, to create awareness, they actually went on a hunger strike um, to force the government to create laws to um, curb um, um, piracy and bootlegging. But um, the Copyright Act still has um, provisions that um, do not encourage remuneration. Um, so the right to remuneration is a class of right that is not provided for under Nigerian law in respect of performers' rights. Whereas in the UK, um, there's the right of remuneration in two categories. So under the UK's CDPA, yes, payment. Under the UK's um, Copyright Design and Patent Act 1988, the most important is the right to claim equitable remuneration from the owner of the copyright in a sound recording where it is played in public or communicated to the public. The other remuneration rights that exist in the UK, so the UK has two. The other one is um, where a performer has transferred their, sorry, just moving my slides, one second. Yeah, where the performer, trying to, yes. This is Nigerian Copyright Act. So in the UK, they have two remuneration clauses, right? So the second one is where a performer has transferred their rental rights concerning a sound recording or film to the producer. And the performer retains the right to a critical remuneration for the rental of or sound recordings or films. So in context of music, it's basically just transferring um, um, transferring to maybe a producer. And like Doctor said, producer in this respect isn't the person who stays with you in the studio while you're making songs. It's um, more of um, in the context of collective management organizations. So these rights can also be assigned to a collecting society in Nigeria, in, so in the United Kingdom. So similar with the EU, they also have um, two rights on equitable remuneration as well. So, um, the Nigerian Copyright Act is not as broad as the UK, EU, or US, but it still provides for the protection of the rights of performers in separate areas. Um, so the Ni Nigerian Copyright Act has been heavily influenced by the Rome Convention, if you're familiar with um, TRIPS, TRIPS um, WCT, and WPPT, as well as the CDPA. Elizabeth, Sorry. Um, because I'm a... Uh... I'm allowed to because we know each other a little bit more. Can you tell us what you mean, PCT, VSUPT, and all, all those acronyms? I'll just, and, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll um, send and it. Slow, and, and just slow down a little bit. Uh, for, yeah, I'll slow down. Sorry, I don't, I don't, I can't see the time, so I don't know how. Long. No, no, you're, you're fine. You can still take five minutes um, before. We, so, five more minutes. Will that work, Elizabeth? Sure. So I'll send in things in the chat that would help, like how you sent the link for the very helpful. Thing you shared last time, the last slide. If oh, absolutely, helps. yeah. Whoa, whoa. Cheat sheets. Hmm. Perfect. So, um, so basically, what I was basically saying when I was mentioning these treaties is that the Nigerian Copyright Act, um, there is evidence that's 
been heavily influenced by these international treaties and by the United Kingdom's copy, um, CDP, CDPA, which is the Copyrights, Patents and Designs Act. Okay. Um, however, there are some areas mentioned, like I said, the remuneration aspect um, and, and protect another foreign laws that Nigeria is yet to include in the Act. So these lacunas in the law, um, they regarding remuneration in particular, they place Nigerian performers at a disadvantaged position, um, given the wealth of experience of producers, especially negotiation, contra negotiation contracts and the inexperience of new talents in the performing industry in contract negotiation. Um, so there's a form of imbalance and um, including remuneration provisions will really create the required equilibrium and not jeopardize the interest of performance in this respect. So, um, let me just go to the next slide and take off the chat here. So, uh, yeah, so back to what I was saying, the main challenges um, reckoned in the Nigerian music industry is weak IP laws, um, piracy, lack of funding, and poor government support. Hand in hand, um, you see how they all affect performers' rights because there are laws to ensure that um, artists are getting remuneration, um, which is getting paid basically. And then when it comes to piracy, um, there are very strong laws by piracy. The laws actually do exist, but when it comes to enforcement, coupled with corruption, um, it's piracy still exists. Um, also lack of funding. Um, the most performers have to like sell, um, they have to sell or have to settle for what they usually shouldn't settle for because they're heavily reliant on endorsements from um, the private sector. Um, also, you know, due to lack of funding and poor government supports. So, um, yes, so I know I was rushing. I didn't know I had how much time I had because there's so many questions coming in for a doctor, but um, that's everything. I hope it was super helpful. If you have any questions, I'm prepared for them and I have a cheat sheet. So if anyone <laughs> that, you would have that, so. Thank you, Elizabeth. Claire, now it's up to you if, if there are any questions. I think me and Elizabeth are done in terms of chatting. Um, from... Okay. Uh, there aren't any questions at the moment. Or if anyone just wants to say about a little bit about their practice or what they were hoping to get from today and if, if there are any points for development or, or anything, we would love. We always like to to imagine, right, Claire, how this would look like if we actually saw faces of people and see if they're dead, bored, or you know, <laughs> puzzled completely, or you know, it's uh, so any feedback, anything, or if anyone just wants to maybe say what kind of music they're into or or anything. No, no, no. There's someone in here from Ghana. Um, I was going to ask if there were any like similarities. I just know Laura through her name, but but she's hiding in the background as well. Um, <laughs> but but otherwise, I don't know the name, so I don't know. Um, wait, I think I know Laura as well. She's like I don't want to pick on anyone. So if if anyone wants to, maybe even in a chat, just say what they do. Um, if they're in the music, or are they composers? Are they DJs? Are they singers, performers? Yeah, uh, for sure. Oh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Sorry, um, um, is it Elizabeth? Yes. Uh, yeah, so you mentioned the I'm the guy from Ghana. Appreciating, yes, ap appreciating Davido wearing the Ghana shirt. He's Nigerian and he's wearing Ghana shirts. So I love that. Yeah. Uh, I, because of that, I'm gonna go and find a Nigerian shirt to wear. Supports. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, basically, um, I asked the question about um, about the Kanye West cover, and you mentioned the MCP. MCP. Um, um, I can send you the link, Isaac. If, if yeah. that help. Yeah. So, so how does that work? Do you do you pay for a license or is it just a, just that you get permission or? Uh, you would pay, but whenever right. you have compulsory licenses, usually the rates are set. So it's not okay. like you have to go in and negotiate afresh or, or anything. Okay. Uh, I'll send you the link now. And, and they, so this is sort of one of the more um, uh, 
you know, practical bits. Okay. Um, so I, I can't tell you really how much it would cost. Okay. Um, but you will see that you have different types. Okay. Um, and that's why it would be very helpful to, to, to you know, uh, if we had anyone from or with uh, more musical expertise to know how this works in practice, how to get your hands on all these licenses. So I sort of know the framework, but it would be very helpful to know what that would mean in. Yeah, because, um, sorry, because doctor, when I asked the question, mm -hmm. um, your answer was like using a piece of the music. But what I meant was literally a whole cover of a whole album in a completely different musical style is what I meant. So it's like a concept album, but yeah. remix, remixing the whole album and then adding sort of, I don't know whether it's, I mean, I'm just using salsa as an example, but just kind of give it a whole different style to the whole album is what I was intending. How possible? Do you think that would qualify as an adaptation? Yeah, yeah, definitely it's an adaptation. I know. Absolutely. <laughs> See, you're talking to a lawyer now. So, you, so adaptation oh. is completely separate, right? So that's an exclusive oh. right where you will even have to have permission to do that separate from, to... from from the artist yeah or whoever's uh, rights owner so it might actually be that with with Kanye that the the rights owner is the record label um okay okay i see so that might even be trickier but i don't know mm. uh, but the right of adaptation is a separate right uh right. In, in musical works but you see you see so many so many tracks on youtube that uh remixes and adaptations just like thousands of them surely well, with YouTube, with YouTube, what you have is you, if there is a potential of copyright infringement, i.e. people doing things that either they don't have a license or permission to do, uh, these things will be caught with something that YouTube has sort of set up as the content ID, right? So they will track when you have certain bits that are reproduced from other original tracks. And then the copyright owner or the rights owner will be, if they've registered those tracks with YouTube, they'll be alerted to that and then they can decide what to do with it. So, you know, even if you are infringing um, copyright, it's the owner that will have the right to decide what will happen thereafter. Quite often okay. you will see that the owners of copyright will actually not mind at all. They mm. might even give you the go ahead without any payment. But okay. technically what I see it as a difficulty is, unless you know exactly where to turn, figuring out where is the, the right port of call to ask that question might be a practical difficulty. Right, okay. You know, who do you ask, really? Um, but I think, you know, a little bit of research online could, could already probably prove as a starting point to see who okay. you would have to ask for permission. Okay. Sorry, I can't be more help, but we can maybe even look further in, in going forward into these different examples and maybe take some of these examples that people have in practice as case studies maybe and we can see if we can figure it out a little bit more and combine and maybe also partner with some of the lecturers in uh jackie has said jackie do you want to comment yeah i think his hand his hand is up for him. yeah we have jackie who said hi comment, please <laughs> yeah uh i started out my music industry career in copyright back in the 80s for warners um and now I lecture and do all sorts of things and uh, teach prisoners about copyright, uh, which is really important. Um, but just Isaac, I, I'm happy to just kind of uh, chip in here, if anyone doesn't mind. Um, Thank you. Just before you kind of go down that route, and I know you use the scenario, mm -hmm. um, but basically the chances are Kanye West, because of how big he is, his camp are just going to say no. <laughs> Um, before you start sort of spending money on remixing. Um, so that's one thing to take into consideration. Um, but, you know, again, it's like if you're dealing with some of the biggest acts, one thing that they might also want to know is if you're going to release it commercially, uh, how many um, sales really, you know, um, what's your following? And they're going to want to know all that because they're going to want some money from it. Okay, so if you could if you could generate some money for them, even if it's like the lion's share, are they likely to say yes? Not, well, I guess not necessarily, because necessarily, yeah. again, they, they may want to listen to it, because if you're an unknown remixer, you know, it's 
your name's going to be attached or their name's going to be attached to it. So they'll they'll want to probably uh, check it all out first. Um, but it's so it's about getting perhaps a bit of ex I know, again, I know you, this was just a scenario uh, that you gave, but it's the fact that you gave one of the biggest names in the music industry. Um, yeah, and the <laughs> not um, only so the biggest, but like one of the most difficult. Your, it's like building up your CV and remixing others. And again, yeah. uh, we're in an academic environment. So the question would also be, would you be remixing it for an academic assignment? Because that's a very different thing to if you're remixing it for a commercial release. Oh, now that's interesting. How, so how, how would an academic assignment, what would that look like? Well, that would just depend because it wouldn't be then released. So if it was something that oh I see yeah, you're yeah doing yeah. like music technology at Wolverhampton or something like that oh I see yeah yeah I see what you, you mean yeah to work on something um, and you just happen to use one of his pieces of music then in reality for educational purposes yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. going to be released it's not going to be put on a platform um, it's just between you and the educate you know your your lecturer to show what you're capable of doing but if anything is going to be um, you know, used publicly, promoted, put on a platform, then you have to go obviously through the correct channels. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thanks for You're that. You're welcome. I have to, perhaps I need to confess why I'm in the room. <laughs> No need to confess, Jackie, unless you're willing to, we would love to connect with you. But yes, absolutely. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd love to connect. I'd love to connect. So maybe um, I'll put my email in the chat because I'm actually at Demorphic Uni, but I have, I wear different hats. And um, yeah, it'd be nice to, nice to chat. Happy to share. Absolutely. Well, thank and thank you. you. <laughs> thank you also for clarif clarifying. I mean, um, it's also, I think, very important to say, so several things, right? One of the reasons why my own work is, is looking at intellectual property law from a different perspective, and that's from a feminist perspective, is that I do think that the rules, the way they're written, they do benefit the bigger players more. And it has to do with, yes, you could always go to court and say, well, you know, I have this fair dealing defense available, you know, under cop copyright law, you can't sue me. But to get to that point, it means you have to have enough funds to actually go pay for all the expert fees and so forth. So there are practical considerations to be had. And I think everything that Jackie was saying around, um, you know, bigger artists, smaller artists, who is more likely to give you permission for certain things, that's just something to be aware of, that it's how these rules will play out in, in, in real world, in the real world. So. Um, Excellent. So we, we know why Jack, no, Jackie, did you say why you're here? You just said you were wearing different hats. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I was just going to type in and respond to some other people, but I'll, I'll just give you a brief sort of overview. I heard about this and um, my, my hat, so I started out in the 80s, as I said, working at Warner Chapel, which is a publishing company. And, and for those of you that aren't sure as who signs the... Um, songwriters, the composer and author, as Metka was talking about at the beginning. Um, and my job there was copyright. And then I went to Chrysalis Music, which is now owned by BMG. Um, and I worked as copyright manager for a number of years. So I worked in the industry for about 20 plus years. Um, and then like quite a few people that get into academia, I was asked to be a guest lecturer at a different couple of universities. <laughs> Um, so I'm now um, a lecturer in arts and festivals management full time at De Montfort University, but I'm also uh, do a bit of private work as a music industry consultant still. But my big thing is taking these kind of lessons and working um, them in the prison environment um, because there's a lot of creativity going on, a lot of songs being written. And unfortunately, prisoners are forgotten and no one shares inf the importance of how IP works and how, where their money can come from. Because if you then get released and your work is active, you need to understand about PPA, PRS, PPL, MCPS, et cetera. This is a, such an important point that really intellectual property could work as an empowerment and inclusivity tool for so many different groups that currently don't have that, that representation in the industries. So prisoners would definitely be one group where 
you can just see all the stories and creativity flowing oh, from, from yeah. everything, but they're not the one that are sort of targeted with all these different rules or in the discussions we've currently seen in the music streaming and debate, you know, nobody spoke on that. So, mm-hmm. so very, well, I, I, ju- I I'll just say, uh, nice to have you, Jackie, and look forward to, to more. Yeah, I'm also writing a paper on uh, the lack of education on copyright. So this is why I've sort of dipped into this um, because it's so, so important. And it's the industry itself used to run a number of campaigns and they've just all got dissolved. Mm. And, um, you know, and, and for example, I'd like to perhaps ask a question if that's okay. Yeah, um, if anyone in the room actually knows of the website called Get It Right from a Genuine Site. I've just heard it mentioned in, in the past, but I'm almost like, I have no idea what it is, but yeah. yeah. This is a government supported website and it's really interesting because no one's no, no one knows about it. <laughs> so it could be against an area that uh, the people in the room might be interested in looking at. Uh, what did you say, Jackie? It's get it right? Get it right from a genuine, genuine site. Uh-huh. Um, it's actually something that has been spoken. So, uh, because I work on the F list, I work closely with Vic Bain. So she's the founder and she's been around uh, with Basca and so many other organizations as well. And she said, oh, you know, that sounds like one of that, cam- one of those campaigns, you know, surely you're aware of that. And I said, nope, not really. So, um, and it's been a, I think a disappointment, wasn't it? That mm. th- there was th- such a great push to actually um, raise the awareness around IP and, and music and you know how to access it. I do think that what, was, what did come across, uh, at least from consumer side of things uh, in the music streaming debate uh, in front of the DCMS committee was that because we can access now Spotify, uh, Apple Music, YouTube and others, and there's that distinction, right, between free access where you need to suffer through ads or whatever. But if you were to pay a premium or a subscription fee, you have unlimited access. I think that has done much more for the awareness around there, there are rights attached to music we, we consume. And I think there's been a bit of a shift. But equally with that, because, and, and that's something that was discussed as well, is the streaming services are competing on, on a price point. And experts have said that the value of song has been reduced. So thinking about different you know, family packages or having access to the world um, catalog of music for $9.99, they're saying that that's, that has had a very negative um, perception around the value of a song which results in the, the artists behind these creations not even earning win, uh, minimum wage. Um, but yeah. I think you've got your hand up. Um, yeah, I have just one question, but I'm, I'm kind of wondering if it's a bit late to start this because it's quite, quite a big one, but it's something that I really, I'm really passionate about. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of the story of Guantanamera and the whole copyright issues around that. My question is about sort of indigenous. I think you're breaking up. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Can I you hear can. me? I can. Yeah. 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 So my my question is about indigenous sort of um, music that's been played for I don't know hundreds or whatever years. That then maybe not hundreds, but yeah, a long time. That then 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 gets falls into this whole copyright ownership thing especially when it's especially when more powerful moneyed people can afford the rights to it and just yeah that doesn't sit comfortably with me but I'm just kind of wondering what what stories you know about that and what kind of yeah what your views are really um cultural misappropriation is a thing Uh, it's not linked solely to music it's linked to textual designs, it's linked to practices, recipes, to so many different, what you would either call traditional knowledge or other aspects and facets. And I think there is a rising awareness around the need to to approach this more fairly, but I don't think we're there yet. Um, but but I agree, I mean, we, we have researchers who look into this and we can definitely put one of these um, and Elizabeth will, will also comment on, on this whole idea of 
Nigerian artists becoming hugely famous around the world before they had commercial success in Nigeria, and then others sort of without the link to Nigeria, maybe sort of, you know, taking some bits that were hugely popular as well and how that played out. But it's a very important uh, topic. And I would say that it's something that needs much more attention from, uh, but it's not something that's ignored at least not by lawyers, World Intellectual Property Organization has huge projects around traditional knowledge and, and there is a push to, to stop cultural misappropriation. But all I can say is that it's work in progress. Elizabeth, do you want to maybe make a note or two on, on cultural misappropriation as well? Yes, um, I think we spoke about this last week. I think it would have been good to mention today as well. But um. Isaac, last week I was just basically talking with Claire and Mecca about how, especially in light of COVID, I guess, because everyone maybe has so much time on their hands. People are doing things like, you know, trademarking cultures, um, like tribes. And um, there's been a huge debate, especially because I think Kim Kardashian tried to um, get a trademark for the term kimono for her fashion brand, which is obviously Western fo focused. And um a kimono is actually like you know traditionally Japanese it's actually it has strong ties to um their heritage and everything so for you to create a, a line and a brand for, for undergarments and you know do a play on words with your name and um you know something that's Japanese and you know it's huge in Japanese culture I think it's very very ignorant and then there's a whole discussion of if you know um um, movements that are linked to people should actually be trademarked like you know how you have the Black Lives Matter and you have now in, it's in the news now where you know people in charge of the movement are under investigation so um, there's a whole discussion on like you know and the layers to, there's there are layers to cultural um, appropriation like there's several layers and in connection to copyrights and um, it's it's really been big like in recent times with that yeah. I don't know if that answers because I didn't really hear his question. It was breaking up, and I tried to mention, but I hope that's yeah. It, it does answer it because my 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 suspicion was that it's very very murky and yeah, it's 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 very complex. Um, it's recently complex. someone tried to oh sorry, recently someone tried to get a trademark for a Nigerian tribe called Yoruba, and, and wow, the company, yeah, the name of the company was um, Timbuktu, which is also an African city. And the company and the trademark, the, the trademark was trying to get for had nothing to do with anything African, just going around and just getting trademarks. And you know how people get like website domain names in advance, like, you know, justinbieber.com and then Justin Bieber happens and he's like, oh, I want to get a trade, um, a website called www.justinbieber.com and it already exists. And then I have to buy and you have, how you have patent trolls and all of that um, does pour over now. It's pouring over now. So. And um, there's like a new branch for cultural appropriation. So, thanks, thank you. Um, I'm just conscious of time, but there is um just a really quick question that um I would just want to pick up on, and and it's you may or may not know. Uh, Mr. Brown just said, is Jamaica's copyright different? Um, it, it's one of those things that I avoid uh, talking about um, when speaking to non-lawyers because it, it does seem to be a bit dry when you're getting into the legal framework or how it's all built and connected. But basically what we say is that the internationally we have a common set of rules. There's some common rules that apply to all World Trade Organization members and, and that would go for Jamaica as well. So there are certain basics that we've seen that have changed Jamaican rules on copyright and other intellectual property rights with uh, what we call the TRIPS agreement. So that was the from 1994 onwards when Jamaica also signed on to that and the rules have become much more expense, expansive. So the, the answer is that at least the core minimum is the same as across the world. To know more, we would definitely need to investigate the specific rules in Jamaica not to sort of say, either way. So the minimum standard of protection would be the same. Um, exactly, specifically depends on the question, but we would have to look at. And, and there are rules available also on the World Intellectual Property Organization platform that gives you links to different uh, rules. You know, what we, in the UK, it's easy to find, but you know, in other places as well, especially when we have non-English speaking countries as well. 
Great. Um, so, shall we wrap up? Because we're, we're like right on the dot of two hours, which is great. And um, thanks everyone for um, for chipping in. I think it's been a really good session. Yeah, and um, stay in touch if there's anything we can yeah. do, or if you have ideas for for what we could look at in the future. Just stay in touch. Yeah. And thank you, Claire, for for organizing and pulling yeah. it together. Pleasure. It's a pleasure. Just um, thank you so much, you. Claire. Yeah, no, of course. I, I just think that they're super useful and um, because we've got them recorded, you know, like I said last week, um, inevitably your career changes and stuff happens and it's just they're just really useful tools to, to have to go back to. And, um, and yeah, and just get in touch with us. If you go away from the session and you think of something, um, just get in touch with us. Um, I think Mech has put her... Um, email in the chat I think it's a bit earlier on in the, in the session um, but yeah do get in touch and um, Elizabeth just put hers on there as well so all right um, anything else you want to add Elizabeth? Uh, Claire? Yes um, I'm super grateful Claire and Dr Mecca for everything and comments as well it's so interesting I, I'm, I think maybe we should even have like another series on like maybe something on you know culture appropriate um, cultural appropriation and maybe we should like continue okay. conversations on twitter now but yeah it's super super interesting also a learning opportunity for me as well so thank you so much for doing your presentations i think they're great and i think they're so useful from that perspective particularly from nigeria as well and um, you know just to have that viewpoint is really really useful and i think that's a really good idea about the cultural misappropriation I think that's a, that could be a really, really good session. So let's hold on to that thought and um, let's have a chat about that. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Sure. Okay. Well, um, thanks everyone um, and to all of our audience as well, for everyone who's, who's been involved and, and um, in the discussion. I um, hope you all found that useful. Our next Arts Fest Online event is on Monday, 5th of July at 6 p.m. And it's the next in our Masters in Conversation series, and that one will be with artist Kathy Wade. So that should be a really good session. Um, you can book for free through Eventbrite. Hope to see you there. Thanks for watching. Bye.